Great. Welcome to Progenesis Academy webinar session 29. Today's topic is fertility preservation. We are very fortunate to have a panel of experts in fertility treatment. We have with us Dr. Catherine Palmerola, fertility specialist at IVF MD, Florida in, in South Miami. And we have Dr. Geraldine Ekpo, fertility specialist at Laurel Fertility Care in the San Francisco Bay Area. Thank you so much for joining us. Of course, Emil, it's great to be here. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Well, as you guys know, today is the topic is fertility preservation. Uh, can you give us a, uh, you know, a general view of what um, uh, fertility preservation entails? And I'll start with you, Dr. Ekpo, and then I'll go to, to you, Dr. Palmeroa. Of course, uh, I think often when we think of fertility preservation, people think about egg freezing. Um, it's a general umbrella that covers the freezing of any gametes, so eggs, sperm, embryos, um, and also freezing of ovarian tissue for future use. Um, it's been more commonly known as you know egg freezing planning for the future, planning for your future fertility, um, and that's when that's what patients typically, uh, or that's the 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 uh, group of patients we tend to see more frequently in our practice today. Thank you so much. Dr. Palmerola? Yeah, so um, fertility preservation is exactly, you know, what the two words mean, preserving your fertility for the future. Um, I always counsel my patients, this is not a 100% guarantee. It's not, and it's as close as we can get to an insurance plan, but it's by no means perfect. Um, and there's general, categories of patients that typically are considering um, fertility preservation. So first it was um, classically developed for our cancer patients who are undergoing um, fertility uh, or treatments that may harm their fertility, chemotherapy, radiation, surgery, that may impact either their eggs or sperm. So one common group of patients that come through for fertility preservations are um, those who are facing a cancer diagnosis and cancer treatments. Um, more recently, we have social um, egg freezing patients coming through. These are women who, for a variety of reasons, are not ready to get pregnant at this time. Um, but with the advent of better cryopreservation technology, we have the incredible ability to save their eggs or preserve their fertility um, for when they are ready to get pregnant. Then there's um, other populations like um, couples who are in a committed relationship but just not ready to have children at this time for work or school reasons, um, similar to social egg freezing, but they decide to freeze embryos. That still is in the category of fertility preservation. Um, and then very young patients, as Dr. Ekpo mentioned, before um, menstruating, we have the ability to freeze ovary tissue for very, very young cancer patients or um, patients with lupus, for example, facing cytotoxic um, therapies, or similarly um, for young boys who are facing cancer treatment as well. So I like to think of those general categories of uh, patients who consider fertility preservation. And it's, a, you know, through our technologies, we have the ability to offer this, which I think is incredible. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, we're going to start uh, first uh, talking about the social uh, preservation or, or, or social egg freeze, and then we can move into the medical one that, that, that is uh, uh, due to cancer therapy and radiotherapy and other things. So uh, would you recommend egg freezing for younger patients that just that are seeking a career that don't know if, how long it's going to take? Sometimes they may be in their 30s and trying to you know, finish a long career. Um, so would you recommend that to average individuals, professionals? So I always have this conversation, when is the best time to freeze eggs? Um, and there's pros and cons of, of all answers. Of course, the younger a woman is when she is considering freezing eggs, the more likely we are to get a high number of eggs and the more likely are we are to get high quality eggs. But conversely, the less likely she is to ever need to use her eggs because she has that much more time to um, meet someone, to have a relationship with, eventually have um, natural conception on her own. 
In contrast, if you wait too long to freeze your eggs, um, we may not get as many eggs. We, they may not be as high quality. However, the older patients are much more likely um, to end up using their eggs in the future. So it's a very personal decision. Um, and I often discuss this with my patients, kind of it's, it's the right age for their situation um, at their time. Yeah, and I think a big factor is also the cost and the, the cost effectiveness of that decision, right? So uh, uh, like Dr. Parmarola said, when you freeze eggs when you're in your 20s, yes, you're young and those are your best quality eggs, but there's a good chance you may not need to use them and you have to balance the cost of storing those eggs because it's not just freezing, but keeping them stored until when you're ready to use them. Um, and on the, on, the convert, on the flip side, waiting too late, you have poor quality eggs. And so you may have to do multiple cycles to get to the goal number of eggs you'd like based on the, the uh, family size you'd like to have. And, and so I, I tend to you know, counsel my patients, it's an individual decision it's based on your age. It's based on sort of what your long-term goals are. And I think classically, we look at the 30 to 34 year old age group as the group that seems to benefit the most where they're more likely to need the eggs. Um, and it's not as costly to sort of keep the eggs frozen. And you said 30 to 34? Yeah, three zero to three four. Um, you know, we're not turning people away who are over 34. Yeah. Um, we're certainly freezing eggs as we see them and just counseling better about sort of how many eggs you may need to get. So when I see patients, I'm able to sort of project, you know, based on your age, based on patients who are going through fertility treatment at this time, this is the number of eggs we're seeing that they need to find one normal embryo, which then increases the chances of pregnancy, which we know is not guaranteed. Um, so it's definitely an individual decision, a, a patient um, individualized decision. Yeah, and, and that was one of the questions we received uh, via Instagram. It was, what's the ideal age range to freeze uh, eggs? But they also asked about freezing embryos. What's the ideal age for freezing embryos? Uh, Dr. Palmerola. So embryos are a whole different game. Um, we have so much more information about the potential of a frozen embryo to result in a live birth compared to frozen eggs. Um, so a, another option for women who are, say, not ready to get pregnant yet, um, they can consider freezing their own eggs or they can consider freezing embryos, whether it's with partner sperm or donor sperm. An embryo is much different. We have so much more information about potential for pregnancy based on age and whether the embryo is genetically tested. In under age 35, a frozen embryo is expected to have a 60 to 70% chance of live birth. Um, genetically tested similar, um, similar expectations. In contrast, eggs have to go through so many different um, steps and processes. So the expected chance of live birth is much more unknown. Um, first, the eggs have to fertilize, then they have to develop into embryos. If genetic testing is considered, we have to achieve a normal embryo. Um, so one um, helpful tool that I use with my patients is actually an online uh, calculator that was developed by Brigham and Women's. Um, it's called the Egg Freezing Counseling Tool. And I find it really helpful. You can actually plug in the women's age, um, number of mature eggs that were frozen, and it pops out an expected probability of one live birth, two live birth, three lives births. So I find it really helpful in terms of counseling before entering the egg freezing process. And then once we're completed the egg freezing process, are we happy with the results that we had? Do we want to consider a second cycle? Um, so much, yeah. But yeah, frozen embryos are, you know, have we have significantly more information about them, um, much higher likelihood of live birth per embryo, depending on whether it was genetically tested or not. But the eggs are committed to sperm at that point, um, which is unreversible. Um, thank you so much. Dr. Ekpo, you mentioned 30 to 34 for oocytes freeze. How about embryo, if someone wanted to freeze their embryos? What would be the age? Well, the, the, age? the reason, it, it's hard to put a number for embryo freezing, right? Because the big difference is, you know, for some of our viewers out there for eggs versus embryos is we cannot test eggs. Um, we don't know the genetic makeup. An egg has to combine with sperm to create an embryo for you to test. And so I look at it more as 
with egg free with embryo freezing, you can get that information now. You can do the analysis, the genetic analysis, to find out if you have a normal embryo to allow you make decisions about perhaps doing a next cycle. Versus with egg freezing, when you try to thaw in the future, do you have that information? So it's really hard to put a, a cut up or like an ideal range. I think that for my patients who, uh, for patients that I see who are trying to preserve their fertility, who are on the older end, so in the fertility world uh, of 35 or older, um, you know, closer to 40, who know they want to have their own genetic child, they're open to using a sperm donor or have a partner where they can fertilize um, eggs and create embryos, I would probably counsel them more towards freezing embryos if they have that option, um, because they may not need to freeze as many eggs to get the information they need right away. Um, so I, you know, I know you want me to hone in on like an age group, but it's very hard to do so because I think it's a, it's a, um, a treatment option for everybody. I think if you had to rank one over the other, I would say embryo first if you can, but like Dr. Pramila said, you're committed to that sperm and then egg would be next. Um, so we, you know, we're freezing embryos and anybody who feels like they're not ready to actually be pregnant and start a family should have that option. Absolutely. Thank you so much. We have, we have another question uh, from another patient from Instagram. Uh, she said, if a woman uses um, IVF to have her first baby, what are her chances of success, statistically speaking, to uh, via naturally or, or through IVF? And I know she didn't mention her age, so it's hard to kind of... Uh, that was going to be my question. Do you want to take that, Dr. Marilla? Oh, uh, it, well, it's very dependent on um, what the factors are in going in. Why did you need IVF for the first cycle? Um, what is your age? What are your diagnoses? Um, if you had extra embryos from your first cycle, I think you have a very high chance of success um, going into it, going into a second cycle. Um, of course, we hear anecdotal stories of women who required IVF for their first baby and then spontaneously got pregnant um, their, for their second baby. We don't have statistics um, or national reporting on how common that is because we don't tend to track natural pregnancies, um, but you certainly hear stories of that. But depending on you know, your age, going into the second cycle of IVF, your diagnoses, um, you know, I would be hopeful. I think there is certainly a chance of success. Yeah, I think the diagnosis is a big thing too, right? So if you are needing IVF because your fallopian tubes are blocked, I'd probably say it's, it's slim to none chance that your tubes will open all of a sudden and you can conceive on your own. Um, but in some patients where everything's normal, so on what we call unexplained infertility, eggs look, uh, numbers look good, sperm looks good, but they can't conceive and they need IVF. Um, at some point they may conceive, but we just don't have that data to be able to counsel. Um, I, I wouldn't say that, um, I usually tell people it's, you have a different threshold to go forward with IVF again after you've had success the first time. So if we let everybody, you know, wait five, six, seven years, I'm sure most people will conceive them, we expect to, but you know, when people try to plan their families, maybe you wanna have your kids closer together, you don't wanna keep the embryos frozen for too long, that may be a reason to, you know, need IVF for the next cycle or choose to do IVF or a frozen embryo transfer for the next attempt. Exactly. And, and uh, we can assume if the patient were successful in IVF and it has not been a long time since she tried her IVF, you can say that she has chances more than if she didn't have, she didn't try IVF or, or if the IVF did not succeed uh, previously. No, it's a sign. It's a good sign that she has a successful IVF treatment, correct? Certainly, but the age is very important um, in the IVF process. So, um, you know, the difference between 37 and 40, even though it's only three years, can make a big difference. Absolutely. 39 and 42, very big difference. Yeah. Um, very good. I have another question from another patient. Um, this time it was a, an email uh, question. Uh, she said, I am 35. I have three embryos frozen. Should I take a break from FET to do um, another egg uh, retrieval now? Or what would you rec recommend to her to do a transfer or to go for another cycle? 
Well, three, three frozen embryos, that's a, you know, that's good. We don't know if these embryos are genetically tested embryos or are they euploid embryos, meaning they have the right number of chromosomes, which increases the chance of a live birth. Um, certainly, if there are three genetically normal embryos and we, she was under 35 when these embryos were created, um, I would say each embryo has about a 60 to 70% chance of a live birth. And so if she's looking to have a family of one to two kids, I don't see... I don't think it's unreasonable to proceed with the transfer. Um, if she's trying to delay childbearing for a little longer or wants to have a bigger family, um, then perhaps it, you know you can bank as you know as many embryos as you're able to. The more you have the the more likely you are to be successful. But if you want to be cost effective and you want to also plan time to pregnancy, we know that women who have, even though we have this option to freeze eggs and freeze embryos, there's still the pregnancy and the um, complications that can occur with um, pregnancies in women who are older. Um, so what we call advanced maternal age, um, well into your late 30s, into your 40s, there's higher risk for you know medical problems, high blood pressure, preterm delivery, that may make sense to proceed you know in starting your family sooner. So that's one thing I I try to tell patients as well. Who you know yes I have you frozen, it's not a guarantee, but we don't want to see you at 50 trying to use those <laughs> eggs ideally. Um, but um, something to keep in mind. Very good. Dr. Palmerola? Yeah, I completely agree. It depends on the desired family size. Um, three embryos is excellent, um, especially if you're under age 35, no need to genetically test. 35 is kind of the cusp I like to think about um, when offering genetic testing, um, but still a very high chance of success, even if not genetically tested age 35. So. Um, I don't think it's necessarily an indi indication to freeze more, um, just depending on desired family size. Thank you so much. I have another question from another patient. Uh, she is 40 years old, an AMH under one, below one. She was asking what are the natural remedies to improve egg quality uh, beside, you know, acupuncture or, or diet or vitamins. Are they other means to improve egg quality? Um, yeah, so great question. Um, this is kind of a, a big black box in our field still. Um, we have no test for egg quality. Um, so we can only test the quality of the eggs once we kind of put them through the test of IVF, see how they develop, how they fertilize, how they develop into embryos, and when we can ultimately test the chromosomes after they formed a blastocyst. But all, otherwise, we have no direct test of egg quality. Um, so therefore, it's extremely difficult to do high quality research um, studies to uh, identify what therapies improve quality, what therapies are not effective. Um, that being said, I do think there are lifestyle changes. I know this question they are asking for other, other things besides lifestyle changes, but optimizing your weight, making sure you have a healthy, balanced diet, having regular exercise, things that make sense to be your healthiest body, they will reflect on egg quality, even if we don't have a direct test of that. Um, there's lots of information about supplements um, that are aimed to improve egg quality, but there's very limited evidence in terms of proven, improvement, proven improvement in egg quality because we can't directly test that. Thank you so much. Dr. Ekpo? Yeah, I'd agree. I think that um, the one thing I'll add, I think you mentioned that this um, patient uh, who reached out um, had an AMH, you said less than one. Yes. Um, and again, that's not necessarily a measure of egg quality. It's very possible to conceive and have a normal life birth with AMH less than one. It happens every day. Um, and so using that as a threshold of thinking, oh, because my numbers are less than one, I don't have good quality eggs. I think it's a common misconception. Um, and, you know, I agree with just optimizing lifestyle, you know, health um, to try to improve the odds of pregnancy happening. But we're not necessarily having any, we don't have any measures to track that, you know, intervention. Um, you know, you mentioned acupuncture, all those things are not dangerous. They don't harm you. So definitely we wouldn't stop you from doing them, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, hey, I'm going to spend two, three years working on um, supplements and lifestyle, and then I'm losing the quality that we know based on just age. Um, so that's the most important predictor of success 
um, more so than any of the other numbers. Very good. Uh, we have a, a patient uh, who wanted to ask live. Uh, Maria, are you there? Um, let's see if Riley, can you connect her? Uh, while you're doing that, I'm going to next go to the next question. Uh, Riley, are you there? Yes. Hi, Maria. Hi. Can you hear us? Hi. Yes. Hi, Hi, Maria. Hi. Yes. How are you doing? I'm, I'm good, thank you. How are Very you? Good. Fantastic. Very good. Uh, go ahead and ask your question. I It's a two-part question. I am 37. And I had five miscarriages in a row. I don't have any living children. So I wasn't be able to have any pregnancies to term. Being at 37, should I try to retrieve my eggs in case I would have to do a surrogate? And still ha hoping to have carry a pregnancy to term. Is there anything that I can do to help carry to term? And we can start with you, Dr. Palmerola. Sure. Hi, Maria. Um, so first, I'm sorry to hear of your um, miscarriages. That's a very difficult thing to go through. Um, at five miscarriages, this absolutely warrants testing. Um, this falls into the category of recurrent pregnancy loss, um, for which there's sometimes reasons that we can um, evaluate and then treat to improve your chances of pregnancy. There's many different possible causes of miscarriage, the most common being abnormal chromosomes, but there's other reasons related to blood clotting, related to immune function, um, related to your chromosomal makeup, your partner's chromosomal makeup, related to your uh, uterus shape. So my first recommendation before considering freezing eggs would be to do some testing and evaluation to see if you have a reason um, that can be treatable to prevent miscarriage. Um, because you can absolutely, based on our findings, potentially carry your own pregnancy. Um, sometimes there's conditions that warrant a gestational carrier, as you suggested, but um, my first recommendation would be to do some testing. And then certainly consider IVF with your eggs, um, with partner sperm or freezing eggs if you're not ready to try for pregnancy again right now. Thank you so much. Dr. Ekpo? Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that, Maria. I think that um, definitely uh, those are great questions in, in thinking about your plan going forward. Uh, I think if you've had workup, I recommend workup, uh, assuming you've had workup that perhaps showed that there's something um, there's something that we can't figure out as to why this pregnancy can go to term and you make that decision um, or you're thinking about the option of using a surrogate. I think being 37, it does make sense to start to think about, you know, potentially um, freezing, you know, eggs, the embryos, just so that you have a better chance that in, of the embryo implanting if you use a surrogate. Um, but I do agree with Dr. Pomerola in terms of figuring out what the reason is for why you have not been able to um, have a life uh, a life term birth. Um, and once we can figure that out, then it would make sense to explain, uh, we can then figure out the best solution. So if for some reason it's a, you know, a chronic infection or um, a hormonal issue that we, that can be fixed, then I don't think necessarily think you would, there would be any advantage of using a surrogate or freezing eggs, right? So um, honing in on the cause, if we can, would be a good, a good thing to do. And would you recommend uh, that she take a karyotype test, her and her partner, to figure out if there are any uh, translocations or, or inversions? Yes. yes. Um, I think that's one of the, uh, one, you know, it's, I know you're asking us this question and we don't really know your background. You may have done all of this already. Um, but um, as Dr. Pamarola said, one of the reasons why you may miscarry is because the way the egg and the sperm combine to create an embryo leads to some. Um, imbalance in the chromosomes. And so by testing the embryos, you can find that, by, I'm sorry, testing yourself and your partner, you can find out if you're at risk for that. Um, so that's one of, you know, many tests that we do in trying to figure out the reasons for the loss before making that decision to freeze eggs. Very good. I, Maria, do you have any other question? Uh, no, but I did had my, so with my last miscarriage, I did had my embryo tested. So, and that's why I've done all the tests out there. 
doctors say they cannot like everything normal and the embryos that I'm losing are normal like there is no nothing about it so they can't explain it and these are the embryos from the miscarriage so at the time of the loss yeah so that's definitely a a good information to have um you know I think again just looking at the big picture and getting some more information but I think based on what you've provided to us so far um, it may make, you know, make sense to sort of explore if there are normal embryos that you're miscarrying and we've ruled out other reasons um, like that we've mentioned, then perhaps, you know, what would things look like using, you know, a surrogate or different uterus that, that may be worth exploring. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Maria. Thank you so much. Good luck, Maria. And good luck to you, Maria. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Let's talk a little bit about sperm. And is it common for a, a, a person who is, you know, planning to have kids in the future, but not anytime soon to do sperm preservation? Is it needed? Great question. I think it's becoming, um, you know, sp- sperm, we've just assumed men well into their late life can get pregnant very easily. Um, but there is more research coming out that, the impact on age on sperm is happening earlier um, than we previously thought. So um, advanced paternal age is becoming more of a factor. There may be changes in the number of sperm, quality of sperm starting at age 40, 45, um, when previously we didn't really think this was a factor until much later. Um, Not as frequent as egg freezing, it doesn't have as much popularity, but um, I do think it's something to take into consideration if a, if a man is not ready to get pregnant for um, many, many years and already um, well into their 30s or 40s, I think it would be a consideration to preserve sperm while it's at its peak quality. Yeah, I think one of the things we mentioned earlier was the, the main, also any medical conditions that may be they may be facing, um, you know, certain cancer diagnosis, certain exposure to medications or, you know, professions or what they do for alleviating exposure to radiation uh, may be a reason to freeze um, sooner rather than later. Uh, but I think, yeah, for so long, we always say, you know, that the women are the ones that, you know, bear the brunt of the fertility or production process and men are able to conceive or be part of a conception process well into your 60s and 70s. But as we collect more data and we're seeing older fathers or uh, men at advanced paternal age, um, we're finding these changes in, in the sperm that's affecting um, the embryo and perhaps increasing the chances of certain me- uh, medical conditions in the children. So um, I don't see that many patients that come to me for egg freezing. Um, I think there's, uh, sorry, for, for sperm freezing, um, but I think there's more of a conversation about that now. Yeah. Um- uh, just to add to your comments, uh, we had sometimes uh, uh, done testing, uh, PGTA testing for a uh, uh, same-sex couple, uh, where the the two partners are providing sperm and then they're looking for they're using a, an egg donor, and we see differences mm-hmm. in euploidy when you look at mm-hmm. age factor. Uh, the uh, we have been like thinking that it's always egg related when you see an abnormality, but really the, the sperm can contribute um, to the chromosomal abnormality in embryos. Uh, and we have seen that. Very good. So um, uh, we've seen a trend in, in, in the industry that certain employers, companies will provide their employee a benefit of doing egg freeze in order to allow them to grow in, in their career and not to have that pressure to, to go into family planning soon. Do you see this as a trend? How do you see this going in the future? And I'll start with you, Dr. Ekpo, this time. Sure. Um, yeah, I think, you know, we've been freezing eggs for quite a bit. I think it's, uh, people don't know this, but we, you know, the, one of the oldest um, one of the first successful pregnancies from uh, egg freeze was back in the 80s. Uh, we were freezing with a method called slow freezing, and a lot of these eggs didn't survive. Um, as the technology c- got better with what we do now called vitrification, um, we are seeing you know great success because these eggs are thawing and doing well and fertilizing. And so 
once the ASRM, the American Society of Reproductive Medicine, I believe in 2013, 2012, um, they're about uh, made it less experimental. Um, that pushed a lot of com companies to start to offer that benefit. Um, there are certain states where there's mandated coverage for IVF and some states where there is now mandated coverage for um, women or couples facing infertility due to or, or um, facing any um, concern for future fertility due to a medical condition, they should be covered. Um, for social freezing, I'm in California and, you know, still close enough to Silicon Valley where a lot of companies were, you know, in the news, Google, um, Uber, YouTube, are seeing patients from all these um, companies who have that benefit. Um, it's controversial as to, you know, is it really the right thing in terms of encouraging people to continue to work, you know, forever so that they, and then feeling reassured that they have their eggs frozen. Um, but at the same time, it's a great benefit. It's providing an option for people who would not even have that conversation um, and saying, I know I want to have a child, I'm not ready, or I think I want to have a child, I'm not ready. I haven't met that person yet. I don't want to do it on my own. Um, I know this is not a guarantee. What can I do to increase my odds? Um, so I, I welcome any insurance coverage for what we do. It's pretty expensive for patients in general. And so, um, you know, we're all about litigating and um, encouraging um, support from any company that's going to cover um, these benefits. So I, I'm a proponent or I support it. I don't know what things are like in Florida. Um, yeah, well, I'm seeing uh, more and more insurances cover offer coverage for this. Um, certainly, it's very dependent on the patient's job and what insurance they have, um, but it's becoming more frequent. And I completely agree. I'm, I love when I have patients who have this benefit through their insurance or through their work. Um, but at the same time, they, you know, they can't, this is not 100% guarantee. So it's as close as we can get to an insurance plan, um, but it doesn't mean that if they're ready to conceive that they should put it off. Very good. I'm going to get get into the uh, technology of x rays and how it evolves over time. But before doing that, let's take a question from a patient. I think we have a patient that is asking live. Uh, Oksana, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hi, how are you doing? Hi, how are you? Very good. Well, thank you for coming in. Uh, please ask your question. Thank you so much. Um, so I have two questions. Uh, first question is about the egg freezing and um, the IVF cycle. Uh, let's say I would speak in my case that I had um, two failed IVF cycles so far at age 39 and age 40. And we were uh, suggested to start to move on to donor eggs. Uh, but in our case, we also have a male uh, fertility issue. So my first question is, um, do you think we should try first with donor sperm and my eggs, given my age? Or should we just move on right away to donor eggs? And the second question is about the sperm. My husband is 50. And um, so his sperm analysis uh, has been different. Like one time we did analysis and it was not so good. Then the, uh, like, let's say six months later, the doctor said, oh, his quality improved. So, so uh, that's, you know, that's the second question. I don't know if you can cover that. Thank you. So difficult, difficult question. Um, often when they're, often it's a multifactorial process. There's both egg components and sperm components that go into the development of the embryo. And it's hard to pinpoint, you know, oh, this cycle failed because it was the egg fault or this cycle failed because it was a sperm fault. It's often multifactorial. Um, every IVF cycle we learn information from, it's an extremely expensive learning process, but we gather information from every cycle that we can use to make changes, make adjustments um, in our future cycles to help with more success. Now, just like we do an incomplete workup for the woman, to find out what specific fertility issues there are. If there are changes in the sperm, there could be an underlying medical condition, structural problem, hormonal issue that may be contributing to abnormal sperm beyond just the age of 50. So he should absolutely have a full evaluation himself to see if there's um, procedures or medications that can improve the quality of the sperm. Um, I do think 
it's reasonable to consider both donor egg and donor sperm. Sometimes we can do um, a split cycle where we use both donor eggs and donor sperm, both um, partner sperm and donor eggs. It becomes a little bit more complicated. Um, some labs are not open to considering that, but it does give us a complete picture of whether um, your eggs are more compatible with the donor sperm or vice versa. Um, but it sounds like a very difficult situation that you've been um, through a lot already. Um, sometimes it's often worth considering a second opinion. Um, there can be dramatic differences in success between different labs, um, unfortunately. And um, certainly you've been through a lot already. I think before diving into a third IVF cycle, it would be worth considering a second opinion, a, a new set of eyes where they can see all of your information and give you a formal opinion. Thank you so much. Dr. Ekpo? So I think, yeah, I agree with that. I think that the other thing when people say they've had a failed IVF cycle, what I always like to clarify is you've had an embryo transfer that was not successful versus you just didn't have good development of the embryos to lead to a transfer. Um, if it were the former, then yes, definitely check in and make sure if there's anything that could have been done differently to help improve implantation. Um, if you're going through the cycles and getting a good number of eggs, but we're just having poor fertilization, um, then it making, you know, thinking about the split cycle may not be a bad idea where you can fertilize some of your eggs with your partner's sperm and then some with the donor to try to get information. I think Nabil alluded to that earlier when you look at um, same-sex couples where you have the same egg source and you have two different male par uh, partners. And that may help answer questions as to can we just get better fertilization um, technology, you know, ICSI, um, uh, intracytoplasmic sperm injection, or even PICSI to help with the eggs meeting the sperm. Um, and just having a, a full picture of your, of your history, perhaps from another provider may be helpful sometimes, um, as we alluded to earlier, but um, it's hard to say, you know, do you do the donor sperm first or do you do the donor egg? I think that if there's an underlying sperm issue, we've worked it out, we haven't found anything of concern, I think you certainly could go, go either way, but it would maybe an easier, almost experimental um, way to figure out what the sperm, what the issue could be by using your eggs and then using sperm from different, from, you know, both like we described, if you're open to that. Um, thank you so much. And just to ask you one more question, Oksana, to clarify what you said when you said uh, failed IVF. Did you have fertilization and uh, transfer of those embryos then, uh, or did the embryos have not been transferred and be arrested or fertilization did not happen? What, what is exactly so, the, the failed aspect? So in our case, uh, we, were, uh, we were right away told to do IVF with HC. And uh, with the first IVF, we had three embryos and they all made it to day seven. But when we sent them for the testing, you know, the genetic testing, they were all abnormal. So it's the embryo quality. And the second cycle, we also, we had two, we actually had three like possible embryos, but none of them made it to day seven. Okay. So it's the, definitely the, embryo issue that like when they combine the eggs and the sperm with ICSI that none of them were viable. Does it add any additional information? Uh, would you pinpoint anything specifically for both of you? Yeah, I think it's different because it, we actually didn't have a transfer I'm assuming, right? Because the embryos were not normal. Yes. Yeah, we never had the transfer. And, and did you have a good number of eggs and end up with three embryos? Or was the expectation that was, was three the expectation based on the number of eggs? Were they, or were they uh, disappointed in the number? Uh, our doctor did say that she was a little bit disappointed with the number of eggs. Like the first um, IVF, we had 13 eggs, only eight were mature and only three fertilized. And then the second cycle, I think we only ended up with five eggs and like two or three of them fertilized, but not did not make it to day seven. So that does make me, the poor fertilization is very suspicious for poor quality sperm um, as a major contributor, but of course there's always egg factors as well. Um, so, you know, before you consider donor egg, which is a very expensive process, 
I think a split cycle with your eggs and using donor sperm might help um, demonstrate if you have significant difference in success with different sperm. And you, Dr. Ekpo, any adjustments in your recommendation? Given no, certainly, I think it, it does agree. I do agree that it points to a, a potential fertilization issue where um, maybe a different sperm source. Um, then having a second cycle with a completely different number then also makes you think about the stimulation and you know there are a lot of different factors where you want medications for too long or too short um can we extend you know that process or what can we do to help with the egg the retrieval itself so that you're starting out with more numbers but it sounds like there may be also be a secondary issue as we said it can be multifactorial so multiple different reasons why people can't um have success um, I do think that the having the three embryos that were sent for genetic testing that came back abnormal, um, I believe you said you were 39 and then the second cycle you were 40. Um, yeah. So uh, I think, you know, there's something to be said about egg quality as well in terms of, you know, the higher risk of abnormal embryos. Um, so it's not, it's devastating when it happens. Um, but when you look at sort of the numbers and the statistics, you know, if you're, when you're testing two to three embryos, um, in a 40-year-old, there's, there's a good chance that you may not find a good embryo. Um, so it is it is complicated. I think it sounds like there may be a combination of both egg and sperm issue here. Thank you. Very good. Um, do you have any other question, Oksana? No, I think i actually very happy that you guys were able to suggest that we should definitely try a split cycle and speak to our doctor about the length of the cycle itself. If maybe I was overstimulated the second cycle and that's why we did not produce so many eggs. So I think we just need to discuss with our doctor, you know, the next steps. Very good. Oksana, thank you so much for your question. We appreciate thank you. It. Thank you so much. Good and good luck to you. Good luck, Oksana. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. So back to the question of uh, cryopreservation technology. How that technology did improve over time? Could you, like what issues would you give to the, the patients about the likelihood of recovering those oocytes after freezing many years? What's the success rate? In, in the so I love the history of medicine. Um, I, I have to have to reference, you know, prior lectures, but our, the human egg is the largest cell in our body and it is very fragile. It's very delicate. It has a large amount of water within it, um, which makes it especially vulnerable to the freezing process. Um, so it, like Dr. Ekpo mentioned earlier, we used to do slow freezing for both eggs and embryos. Um, embryos being numerous cells. Um, they were at first the three cell or three day, 10 to eight to 10 cell embryos and now 100 to 200 cells at the blastocyst. They would tolerate this slow freezing process much better than the single cell egg. We would lose significant numbers of eggs um, in this process. It was, it was very experimental, um, not recommended as routine therapy, um, but only a last stitch effort for patients going through chemotherapy. Now with vitrification, um, this technology involves liquid nitrogen. So eggs are essentially flash frozen and it avoids the crystallization that was forming as a result of the slow freeze process and the development of ice crystals within the egg, which would then destroy the egg upon unfreezing. Um, with the liquid nitrogen vitrification, they are instantly frozen, um, which for scientific reasons and physics and physiology that I are beyond my comprehension, they tolerate this much better. Um, we still lose eggs in the process. Um, on average, we can an anticipate an 80 to 85% survival is what I quote my patients, but it is very dependent on the lab that you use to freeze your eggs. Um, so I often congratulate my patients that are coming to a fertility center for freezing their eggs instead of a standalone egg freezing clinic because fertility centers actually have experience in using the, these eggs in the future, which is critical. Um, 
often standalone fertility centers, they ship these eggs out elsewhere and have no, no reports on the subsequent outcomes of, um, of those eggs. So it's very dependent on the fertility center. Um, the, the center that freezes those eggs is automatically the expert in unfreezing. Yes, we all generally use this, a similar technology, um, but when the own center is unfreezing their eggs, they're automatically the expert. You can anticipate about an 80 to 85% survival. Thank you so much. Dr. So Ekpo? Yeah, I think, I think you mentioned that we have some uh, interna international viewers, and I know that in certain countries, there's still just slow freezing available um, for various reasons. Um, um, I, I, I quote 85 to 90, so close close to what you what you yeah. say um, in terms of based on our internal data, and I think it's all dependent on the lab. Um, but to compare to the slow freezing method, we used to have a 40 to 50 percent survival, so it's a big improvement um, with this technology. I've I've been in practice um, for about the last five five the last last eight years five to eight years, um, and we've always done vitrification, so I have not had the experience of um, for eggs of slow freezing eggs. Now there's some embryos probably in our practice from, you know, 15 years ago that were frozen, you know, that way or patients would certainly move and transfer to us. And we do see differences in, in survival um, with the slow versus the vitrification method. So if you're anywhere where anybody's, you know, still offering you slow freezing and you know that there are other places that do vitrification, I think you'd be doing yourself a huge favor by finding a clinic that has the more up-to-date technology. Thank you so much. And now moving to uh, cryo cryopreservation for, you know, uh, patients that are undergoing treatments, cancer treatments and other type of uh, treatments. Um, it, we, before starting that um, angle, I would like to ask you guys to, uh, uh, you know, help us understand how chemo and radiotherapy affects reproductive tissues. Why is it uh, needed that a patient undergoing certain treatments uh, take a, a, a have it preserve their 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 tissues reproductive tissues. Yeah, certainly um, eggs. Uh, so chemotherapy, certain types of chemotherapy, not all types, um, can affect. So chemotherapy targets cancer cells that are fastly dividing cells, right? Um, and we know that that's the same for sort of eggs and the division process. And so by default, just the same way when you go through certain chemotherapies, you sometimes lose hair because that's another um, rapidly dividing um, cell or part of the body. The same thing can happen with, with eggs. Um, and so that's one way chemotherapy uh, can affect egg, um, egg quantity. Um, it can cause women to, uh, it can accelerate the process or the aging process where they end up going through menopause sooner. Um, so they stop producing viable eggs. Um, and so that's the reason where if you have a cancer diagnosis um, or you take certain medications with certain autoimmune conditions that can affect the eggs, it may make sense to consider um, freezing, um, you know, eggs, you know, embryos if you can before that process. And um, Dr. Pamela mentioned that earlier, how that was really the reason we started freezing eggs. It was for um, medical, medical indications. Um, so it wasn't really a social elective thing. And then we sort of took that idea and then um, extended it to others. So that's really why we see um, why that's the issue with chemotherapy is the impact on the, on how fast the cells and the eggs divide and it affects the ability to repair any issues um, um, that the eggs or, you know, when cells divide, they can try to correct any problems, but sometimes some chemotherapies take that ability away from the cells and so they just die off. Um, and so trying to rescue and capture them before they go through that process is the goal of egg freezing. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Palmerola. Yeah, so exactly as Dr. Ekbo mentioned, not all chemotherapies um, may impact egg quality, egg quantity, um, but also the dose, the duration, and your age at which you're undergoing a chemotherapy treatment also has um, important impact. Certainly, if you're very young, we have high egg numbers um, to begin with. Potentially, you you know, chemotherapy will not necessarily place you into menopause, but it may cause a hit on the um, on your egg numbers. If you're older, um, in your late 30s, early 40s, and you go through chemotherapy, 
yes, chemotherapy may put you into early menopause. Um, so just to add that dose and duration um, and your age at which you're exposed to chemotherapy is important and similar with radiation. Very good. Uh, later on, we're gonna get into uh, tissue preservation uh, for, for cancer patients. But before doing that, let's take one more question from Becca. I think we have one more patient asking live. Becca, are you there? Uh, Riley, maybe you can reconnect with Becca. Hi, Becca. I had unmuted her. Yes. Hi, Becca. Um, Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi, Hi Becca. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know. Um, <laughs> so my husband and I have done IVF um, once. We were unsuccessful. Um, due to my history, I am a patient of endometriosis. I've had nine surgeries for that. Um, the quality for um, eggs, I um, see Dr. Brown. <laughs> He's my doctor. And um, our quality wasn't as great. Is there something that I can do to increase that? Or in, have you seen an endometriosis patient that IVF actually works without donor? So endometriosis is very hard. Um, and especially describing nine surgeries, I'm going to assume that you have extensive endometriosis, possibly, um, especially if it involved your ovaries requiring surgery on the ovaries, um, that can be a big hit on egg, egg quantity. Um, but in endometriosis, we have seen a decline in quality of eggs after um, genetically testing embryos compared to peers your age without endometriosis. Um, but it absolutely can be successful. Um, you know, like I said before, one failed IVF cycle, while is, it is an expensive learning experience, we do learn a lot um, and things that we can adjust moving into another IVF cycle. Um, active endometriosis can cause a lot of inflammation, um, which can impact egg quality. So um, depending on when your last endometriosis surgery was, sometimes a, um, another endometriosis surgery might be necessary or other hormonal therapy to suppress um, the endometriosis lesions before jumping into another IVF um, process may help with the inflammatory impact on your egg quality. Um, otherwise, you know, we don't have proven treatments to improve egg quality. Um, it's there. It's kind of anecdotal because we don't have a direct test of egg quality. Dr. Expo? Yeah, I know it's, it's the question that I wish you, we had the answer you would like to hear, um, which is this is what you do to improve quality and we just don't have that. Um, it's very, you know, I think that the amount of surgeries and sort of the underlying amount of, of, of the burden of disease is what we say, how much endometriosis you have um, and how frequently it's coming back after surgeries will make a difference uh, in terms of uh, the quality. I, in terms of stimulation, I have had success with patients who have a Lupron-based protocol. Um, that's just one medication we use in, in um, the cycle to prepare the eggs. So that's the only thing I may recommend if your doctor is not currently trying that is just to see because we use Lupron in women with endometriosis who are not trying to be pregnant um, to just sort of shut down the ovaries for a little bit. And so maybe considering that as part of the uh, treatment approach, if that's not being done already. Um, but, you know, other than everything Dr. Pramila said, there's really not much else that we know of to help with the quality of the egg. Similar, you just reminded me, Dr. Ekpo, um, similar to the use of Lupron um, to kind of suppress en endometriosis growth. I've also used Famara or Letrozole during a stimulation cycle um, to keep estrogen levels very low. Um, classically, we use this for breast or ovarian cancer patients going through stimulation to keep estrogen low. Um, but with endometriosis, that those lesions are stimulated by the high estrogen levels that we get mm -hmm during a stimulation process. So um, another thought might be adding letrozole to keep those estrogen levels low. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I do the same. Very good. Becca, do you have any other question? No, um, I thank you for answering that. Um, I, I have done two of the surgeries were ovarian cancer-based surgeries um, due to masses found in my uterus. So we're even lucky that we're able to do IVF right now. So thank you for answering that. Ideas to bring back to my doctor, thank you. 
You're very really welcome. Good luck to you. Thank, Thank you. you. So, thank you so much and good luck to you, Becca. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, we were talking about uh, ovarian tissue um, um, preservation and, um, and maybe testicular tissue as well for male uh, undergoing, um, you know, therapies. What is the, the six, do, do we know, do we have enough um, practices doing this kind of, uh, you know, surgery and recuperation of tissue uh, after preservation? How, what is the success rate in this type of uh, procedures? It's certainly considered experimental um, and it's, it tends to be done at more academic institutions in that uh, with, with an experimental um, approach. Uh, so uh, in terms of numbers, I know that, I, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head in terms of number of successful pregnancies um, because there's two parts to it, right? It's actually collecting the tissue if you're gonna do ovarian cryopreservation, freezing them. And so far right now you have to do an auto transplantation back into the, the, the woman later on, or you know whoever is going to carry, um, versus the idea of perhaps getting tissue, freezing them, and then maturing cells later on. I do not believe we've had successful pregnancies from the latter, but I think that from um, auto transplantation back after preserving, we have had success. And and the reasons to do that is if for some reason you just don't have time to do an egg freezing cycle. Um, because you know, time is of an essence, you need a couple of weeks to stimulate the ovaries. Um, it's a young girl who has not gone through puberty quite yet. And so we don't have the ability to get them to stimulate or create eggs, sort of just getting immature eggs to hopefully mature um, outside the body. Um, certain autoimmune conditions, I think certainly with stem cell transplants, um, uh, that's, you know, it's, it's a definitely not an area of expertise of mine. Um, and, but certainly I think um, there are places out there that are made that sort of their focus in doing the research uh, to try to help patients who have don't, who don't have that option. But it's um, and the SRM considers it completely experimental. It's certainly not done for social reasons. It's usually for med a strong medical indication. Yeah, Dr. Pagandora. Agreed. I'm um, you know it's considered experimental. We don't have good success rates because it is um, so infrequent. Um, but there are major academic centers that are working really hard to improve the technology in terms of both freezing the ovarian tissue effectively, unfreezing it, um, use of auto transplantation either back into the same site of the ovary or sometimes it's placed in other um, areas of the body um, and which can respond to stimulation. But then also in vitro mat maturation or um, developing these follicles in, um, in the lab is still considered very experimental and hopefully emerging, you know, I think it'll be one of the major emerging technologies over the next decade, um, I hope, because some, you know, these young prepubertal girls have very limited options. Ovarian tissue is really their only option at this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. That's why I was going to say that for those kids that have happened to be in the treatments of, of K1 radiotherapy, they don't really have an option for an egg retrieval or anything. So uh, tissue preservation is the only thing they have. Um, very good. Well, um, I really enjoyed the conversation with both of you, Dr. Palmerola and Dr. Ekpo. Um, before we wrap up the webinar, I would like to give you guys a minute to introduce your practice and tell us what you do. And then we move on into wrapping up the, the webinar. And I'll start with you, Dr. Ekpo. Sure. So thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been really great to have this conversation and um, educating um, our listeners out there about options to preserve fertility. I am at, at Laurel Fertility uh, based in San Francisco uh, Bay Area um, with okay. offices in the Central Valley area of San Francisco of, of, of the Bay Area. Um, Modesto and Fresno um, satellite offices, but we're mainly based in San Francisco. We offer all fertility treatments, um, all except for ovarian <laughs> cryopreservation, um, but anything from egg freezing to sperm freezing to IVF, embryo transfers, um, semen analysis, the full workup for couples who are struggling or having a hard time um, expanding their families to um, same sex um, couples who are trying, who you know need assistance um, to get to that goal. 
Um, and um, yeah, we try to be more personalized in our approach. Um, we're in an area where there are multiple bigger practices, but we've been able to survive and do well with good pregnancy rates by you know, being in touch with the patient and trying to personalize and individualize care. Um, so um, if you're in the San Francisco area, California area, or wherever you are, we see patients from all over the country and um, even internationally, um, and you're looking for sort of a good fit with personalized care and good success rates, then um, come to Laurel Fertility. LaurelFertility.com is our website. Thank you so much. Before I let you introduce your practice, Dr. Paul Nerola, we are going to be uh, doing a raffle after that. So a raffle for a gift. Um, and then with that, we will wrap up the, the webinar. And I'll let you introduce your practice. Sure. Um, so thank you so much for having me. It's been so much. Uh, I've had a great time answering questions. Fertility preservation is one of my passions. Um, I just think it's an incredible opportunity that we can give patients, you know, again, it's not an insurance plan, but it's as, as close as we can get. It's really empowering um, for women to take control of their health. Um, so I am a recent addition to IVF MD down in Miami, Florida. Um, I recently finished my training uh, in Columbia at New York City, and I joined IVFMD about a year ago. Um, I was attracted to this practice because they were a large private group practice, but they practiced um, evidence-based medicine, personalized medicine, and have excellent outcomes. Um, so I'm at their Miami location. We have six locations across Florida uh, and four IVF labs, which is uh, very, it's many labs for a private practice, I will say. Um, I love my practice. My patients, I think, are, are very happy with their care with us. Um, in the era of COVID, we offer virtual visits. We actually were offering virtual visits routinely even before COVID. We have many international patients from um, Central America, Europe, um, you name it. So we are, our virtual is part of our, our daily practice. Um, we offer free second opinions for those who are looking to um, expand their fertility options. Um, and our website is ivfmd.com. Thank you so much. Uh, now we're going to do a, a raffle for attendees. Um, Riley, maybe you can share your screen and, we, we, uh, and you can take it from there. Yes, of course. Uh, are you able to see my screen right now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so I just want to thank everybody who um, have been supporting us. Uh, some of you may not know this, but we've been doing these similar webinars since um, all the way back in April. So this is just one of the ways for us to, you know, show some of our appreciation. All right, let's get this started. <laughs> Okay, so the winner um, has a number 51. Um, I will be contacting you shortly. Very good. Well, congratulations to number 51, whoever he is or she is. <laughs> um, so with this, uh, we are coming to the end of the webinar. I would like to extend my gratitude and appreciation for what you do for patients and for your expertise and contribution. Thank you so much. I, we will see you next week. Thanks, Emil. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye.